Well, I started off, um, my dad was interested in horse racing and dog racing. And we used to go to um, Wimbledon Greyhounds on a Saturday night, which is 15 minutes away. It was, it's now shut, unfortunately. And he also used to take me to uh, Plumpton and Fontwell during the school holidays. And I got interested in that. I remember going to Cheltenham for the first time, probably when I was sort of 10 or 11. And I wasn't actually massively interested in the racing, but I do remember spending hours of the day just in the betting ring. And the betting ring in those days um, was much more interesting and vibrant than it is now. Um, and the action was all on course. There was no internet at all. Um, obviously, this is 30, <coughs> 35 years ago. Um, so things have moved on a bit since then, but it was a very exciting place. And if you were a punter years later, when I did become a punter, the betting room was where you went. You couldn't, there wasn't early prices on all of these races. Um, so you had to wait until the on-course bookmakers formed the market. And your opinion then counted for a lot more than it does now, for instance, because if you knew something was a solid even money chance, you could well get seven to four, six to four, playing your opinion against the on-course bookmakers. If it was 7-4 to four in the sporting life, it probably would be 6-4 to four or 7-4. to four. So you did have that um, later on, as, uh, that rush of excitement as a punter. Um, whereas now, I'll know something might be even money, and I want to back it at even money, it's liable to be 8-11 to 11 or 4-6, to six, unless I'm wrong, uh, in which case it might be 6-4, to four, and I will be wrong, they'll be right, i.e. the Betfair exchange layer. So no... Um, I basically did get into it through family, um, but I got into bookmaking a bit later on after university, basically. Now, obviously, I'll be doing at least seven or eight hours a day for betting expert, just get that in. Um, but a lot of it is research and following the form. So I'd say the bulk of my time as a punter is spent watching, which is very boring. It's not exciting. It's watching racing over and over and over again, trying to see things away from the obvious. It's it's no good um, watching racing and saying, well, that's just one impressively by 25 lengths. He could be a top class horse for Nicky Henderson. Everyone knows that. It's better to be watching things like the head ons, which way horses jump, their starting position, the pace of a race. So it's boring, but I spend most of my time um, watching racing and making notes on racing, um, tracking horses, looking at races. And then in the mornings, um, I'll look at races from points of view. I always look at the front three or four in the market and I'm looking for weak links in the chain, a reason to have a bet. If I think there's three or four runners who can possibly win, um, I'm looking to oppose one of them. So if something's three to one and it won last, I'm out jumping right and it's now going on a left-handed track, I'll think, well, I think it's going to lose a lot of the ground at the fences. I want to play in a race where that's taking up 25% of the market. I'm now going to look at these other three who I think have got a chance and try and decide which one I think of those three is the value. So I'm sort of summarising it, but you're sort of looking for reasons why the market is slightly wrong. In the old days, you could just fancy horses and think, I know my opinion's all right, I've watched a lot of racing, I think this horse is a certainty, I'm going to back it if it's evens. Now, that's already been priced in. That sort of initial knowledge is no longer relevant. Also, I used to play a lot each way, uh, and that is something that has now become completely defunct. The market's caught up. Betfair shows everyone when it's a bad each way race. You can't get on anyway, um, so you have to move on. I mean, one thing I will say, what my typical day is like, you do have to evolve. Um, 20 years ago, I was quite a big bookmaker at the dogs. The dogs no longer exist. You've got to find other things. Um, so betting, uh, betting expert for instance has been a wonderful opportunity for me I've done it for about seven years now uh, running the racing pages and that gives me a chance to use my um, knowledge and skill hopefully to help other people um, who can get on with bookmakers uh, find some value and make some money it's probably more pertinent to talk about being a bookmaker because um, that was when I did play relatively speaking very big um, I started off straight from university, I got a, a share in a book um, with somebody who was an existing bookmaker there, somebody else dropped out, and in those days you could field a lot more money than you can even now, 
and the expenses were very small relatively speaking um, I think it used to cost us um, say two or three hundred pounds a week to bet at three meetings and the staff's wages were 30 pounds your betting license was 50 pounds um, so it was a completely different game um, and you'd walk on to the dogs and there were 12 races a night three times a week and you could field um, between 300 and 2,000 pounds every race now if you walk to Cheltenham today um, they'd be struggling to take over 500 pound a race in good pitches midweek it's completely gone um, but in those days you did have a chance so I did um, for the dogs what I do now for the horses I watched a lot of videos as they were then mm-hmm. not um, DVDs or uh, streaming that we now mm-hmm. watch so they were videos VHS videos and I'd watch the dogs over and over again get to know them I'd go to trials because I had the time um, and I think I had better knowledge then than I have in 25 years since to be absolutely truthful um, but you could bet your opinion so at the age of 22 I was probably standing dogs to lose two or three thousand pounds on the bigger nights maybe a bit more than that because you could and uh, there was no bet fair so if I made something 20 to 1 and I could lay 8 to 1 I virtually wouldn't stop laying it mm. you know I might have had 10 grand in the world I'd have probably stood it for half of that you know mm-hmm. um, but uh, I did have an edge that um, I don't think the on-course bookmakers now have got, for instance, because they're not laying eight to one about twenty to one chances. They're laying um, six to four about six to four chances, mm-hmm. and a lot of the time they're laying six to four about eleven to eight chances mm-hmm. these days because there's no money there, and every bookmaker wants to lay a short price favourite. It's in their DNA. Um, so there were ups and downs in those days, but it was a good start in life. It was brilliant fun. The banter was great. I was a young 20-something year old, um, so you could stand things, bet your own opinion, whether or not I won or I lost it didn't, I didn't have a mortgage, a family, Mm. so it was fun, you know, it was a, we'd go to the Caribbean one year and be in the caravan the next, it it was (laughs) ups and downs, swings and roundabouts, Um, but it was reasonably profitable. Um, As a punter, I don't think that served me particularly well in the early days, because I think I thought, um, because you could win and play quite big bookmaking I think I played far too big um, as a punter in my late 20s and 30s when Betfair was introduced so when it came around I had a £20,000 float at the dogs for instance and I'd stand dogs for two or three grand regularly um, and I was playing on that scale as a punter into Betfair thinking I was sort of Johnny big boy you know I can take the world on and Betfair is a terrific leveller. Uh, you're up against the best opinions, much, much better than mine. The prices tend to be right. And in those early days of Betfair, um, I played far too big on it, and I did have some very bad losses. It knocked me back. Um, in later years, I've learnt to manage and control how I play, and I play much more safely, try and stay in first gear, uh, and try and win small and regularly rather than having huge swings and um, a very good bookmaker um, Martin uh, from Pool says there there are old pilots and bold pilots but there's no old and bold pilots and it's better I think that is a very good thing to remember it's much better to be safe play in your comfort zone sleep well at night if you've lost 500 pounds or a thousand pounds you can live with it Whereas in the old days, the swings were much bigger. Um, And I think it's an age thing as well. You get older and wiser and you've got more responsibility. I think you need to specialise in certain areas. Um, So, for instance, if you do the flat, do two-year-olds or do middle distance horses. Or if you do the jumps, I think the jumps is manageable. I tend to focus on the jumps for my own punting mainly these days because it's manageable there's no evening racing to speak of there is a bit in the summer but it's five or six meetings a week rather than 36 meetings a week Um, you can watch the replays update your database stay on top of the form Um, I think there's much less skullduggery on the over the jumps Uh, they run a lot less so there's less horses not fancied on certain days whereas on the flat horses are running on the all-weather 25 times a season you don't know what 
you're going to bump into Betfair will tell you late um, I much prefer the jumps so I think you need to find something where you know more about the subject than the market does you know you've got to find so say for instance you're interested in non-league football you'd be much better off concentrating on non-league football than you would knowing about the Premiership because everyone knows about the Premiership yeah, yeah. you know if Harry Kane's injured you'll be the nine millionth person to know about it they'll all know ahead of you and they'll certainly know in the Asian market whereas if you concentrate on the Division 4 of the Vauxhall Conference and you watched Stevenage play last Wednesday and they were absolutely diabolical and their star player got stretched off at that point you'll know more than 99% of the market and you might go on Betfair and see that Stevenage are 2.2 at home on Saturday playing someone level with them and that, that could be a terrible price it could be the wrong price so there is there is you've got to find angles it's no good knowing about everything it, it's just trying to find a weakness in a price to back something else a lot of the time rather than um, fancying things or I like Liverpool or I support Stevenage I'm going to back them or that's my favourite horse Desert Orchid like Frankel's a good horse I'll back them. and it's just got if you're going to do it professionally for a living it's absolutely got to be about price not fancies so you've got to think what is this horse's true chance I think it's 8 to 1 well it's 14 to 1 I'm going to have it winning if I want to play in that race I mean the one temptation that I still have difficulty with as a punter is limiting when you play when it's all you do um, you can become something of an action junkie there's racing on every day. We've just watched Cheltenham today. We're going to Kempton tonight. Mm -hmm. If you're in that sort of mindset, you could be looking for 14 bets a day, couldn't you? You're sat there. It's very hard to sit on your hands. Bet fares there. Bet 365's there. Mm -hmm. You've got options. You can end up playing all the time. And I think that does... It's certainly, I know in the past, um, you're sort of so wrapped up in it or you find yourself betting much more than you should be. And if you can filter out bad decisions and stick with the good ones even if they don't win you can still make lots of good decisions and lose um, but you need to concentrate on just sticking with the good decisions really. this will sound terrible but I actually miss getting out of the house I think hardest part um, of being a punter is the solitude in some ways I've, no I've noticed myself actually meeting you today I, I have spoken to other people this week but you do find yourself talking very quickly because it, it's partly the sort of excitement of not being sat in your own in your office upstairs um, and that I do think the solitude is a big part I try and make a conscious effort to get out of the house I play football go to football try and go racing a lot less these days but just to break out of that sort of four walls you can get very wrapped up in it all uh, and it's important to have a life outside of it but I do miss um, the dogs it was terrific banter and having staff and responsibilities was fantastic. And um, you can't replace that with a computer screen. I mean, all punters now, the vast majority, nobody goes racing anymore. There's very few people who regularly go racing. Um, it has completely died. You don't need to go racing to have a bet. So unless you're a wonderful paddock judge, which I've never been, there's absolutely no point in sitting in the car for three hours, spending a hundred quid every time you go. You're not gonna have a bet there. The time can be spent watching the videos and watching the form and pricing it up and getting on online. Um, it's very hard. To, that being said, if it's Royal Ascot or Glorious Goodwood, I'll go for a day out and it'll be fun and a sociable day. I won't have a bet. I might even have a drink. Um, and it's fun, you know, uh, not a grind. So I, the thing I would miss about the bookmaking, I would say, was the camaraderie and the banter. Uh, and the negative of being a punter. Um, someone who sits at home is that it is uh, the solitude and the lone not I'm not alone I'm quite happy in my own company but um, I do think there is an element of you do go slightly round the bend if you're on your own for too many days on your own I think the hardest part about when you're having a good spell is to keep yourself in second gear because what I actually do find is that I mean for instance today we're filming this on a good day because the nap the World's End won at 2-1 to one and Cobri won at 12-1, to one, so we're all a, a, a bullion and upbeat. Um, the temptation is when you've backed two winners is you think you're invincible and your stakes increase. So while the World's End might have been a wonderful bet at 2-1 to one and Cobri was a quite a good bet at 12-1, to one, your staking has to stay the same. It's no good now 
having a bet in the cross country race because you've backed two winners. I've got no clue about it. the temptation when you're on a winning run is to play bigger and more frequently because you suddenly think it's something you've got to the one thing I hate about punting and I try very hard not to do it is not to boom winners it's the worst thing in the world because it, it's very conceited and there's no upside nobody else cares it's for your own benefit you know there's no need to jump up and down and shout just as you shouldn't be smashing up the television when you've had a loser you shouldn't be jumping up and down with joy you've got to try and stay even uh, tempered about the whole process and that includes winning and losing and actually you're right to ask that question because winning being a good winner is a harder part staying controlled not going to Barbados just when you've had a good month playing the same the following month you know not buying the car and selling you know you've got to stay level-headed really and treat it just as you would at any other business that was making a profit or a loss and it is easier said than done much more money orientated as I've got older. One of the things in my 20s was that I had rent to find. We lived in a flat in Islington, in central London. The rent was £600 a month. Both of us were working, so if I lost every single week or had terrible spells, it didn't matter, we'd still pay the rent. As you get older, you have children. I think it's a big turning point being a punter because um, let's say every month you've got to find £5,000. Well, that's quite a lot every four weeks. You can't actually afford to be losing for any... I mean, you can have bad months and all the rest of it, but it can't go on for very long because you'll soon find yourself under a lot of pressure. Um, so that does focus your mind. You can't really have fun bets. You know, I did, I did watch an interview with a punter the other day who said he still has fun bets on the football and things, and I was surprised by that because I thought, well, really, that's not what it's about. You know, you are it's become much more of a grind and in some ways it's good because it makes you disciplined rather than just a recreational punter you know mm -hmm. you do actually have to you know you've on paper got to win a certain amount every month if you can I'm not saying you'll win it every month some months it'll be better some months you'll lose it happens um, but it does provide a framework for sort of discipline you know. I tend to say that I'm a racing editor now uh, because I, we went to Morocco a couple of years ago and I sort of tried to explain to the chap in customs that I was a punter. So then I said I was a journalist and I, you sort of end up almost in captivity for two days trying to explain your way out. Being a punter is not a... I did used to say I was a bookmaker. I mean, I haven't been a bookmaker for nearly 10 years now, I guess, seven, seven or eight years. Um, I, I, being a professional punter, I don't think it sits that well with people. So I prefer to say, well, I'm a racing journalist or a blogger or I'm a racing editor it sounds more respectful and I am of course and, and I think you have to be honest about your limitations as a punter I don't think it's possible uh, it's certainly not easy to regularly win what you need to win to survive in the modern world um, we were talking off camera about how much life costs these days and when you've got a family it's very expensive um, you've got to be a very good punter to be able to sustain the lifestyle you want to have um, just from betting um, I'm not ashamed to say that I've worked for betting. It's the best job I've ever had. It allows me to hopefully give some of my knowledge to other people who are getting interested in betting and racing. Um, and it allows me to concentrate on the form and my own betting. It's sort of a, a perfect medium. But I don't think, I think a lot of people would consider themselves professional punters but do have other streams of income that are reliable. Rather than hoping you don't bet 20 losers on the turn, you do think, well, at least, you know, we can afford to eat this week. Um, it it gives, takes the pressure off a bit as you get older. Um, I, I, I completely salute anybody who does 100% professional punting. I think fair play to them. They are, and often these people are incredibly clever, uh, much brighter than I am. If they weren't professional punters, they'd be engineers or scientists or top-notch journalists. They're very, very intelligent people. You know. Well, actually, they're both the same. I mean, Desert Orchid was a wonderful horse. Um, he was a great... I did go racing a lot when he was running, um, probably in my teens, ageing myself again. But he was an incredible spectacle. For, if anyone hasn't seen it, it's all on YouTube. Uh, he was a front-running grey who won from two miles to three mile five. He was incredibly versatile. In those days, they tended to run in handicaps rather than level weights races. So he was giving away stones in weight to some 
pretty good horses in that era over about a five year period. And the best race I can remember, and it's still, if you watch it, it's on YouTube, um, when he won the Gold Cup at Cheltenham, I forget the year now, but he beat a horse called Yahoo, who was a mudlark. And if there'd been Betfair then, um, Yahoo would have been 1.001 a long way up the running and uh, Desert Orchid rallied again having been in front, been headed, been in front and got back up and he hated the ground, it was hot deep ground, it was over a trip that was far enough, he didn't really like Cheltenham, he had loads of negatives against him and it's still sort of one of those races, you say, oh, I'm not really an emotional but you do feel yourself welling up a bit it's because it's a brilliant race, um, well worth looking out if you can. <laughs> Um, all right, so let's just talk about quickly. Oh, you're getting cold, or yeah, I'm, cold. Right? Yeah, I'm getting freezing. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> it's getting just like the snow. Yeah, it's just freezing.